All right, I'm pleased to be joined by the uh, BC Conservative leadership candidate, Dan Brooks. And Dan, you made an announcement this morning, something that I think British Columbians and maybe all Canadians would be really interested to hear. You announced the decision that your campaign would like to start a Crown Corporation um, that would deal with the construction of a pipeline to Tidewater. Tell us a little bit more about it and your plan. Yes, so Chris, what we're going to do is we're going to create a Crown Corporation in British Columbia called the BC uh, Energy and Pipeline Corporation with the sole mandate of essentially move, moving crude oil from the Rocky Mountains to Pacific Ocean. And we're going to take the lead as a government, as a potential government, and that's the key plank of our economic platform that I'm proposing as a candidate for the BC Conservative Party. So this would be a little different, uh, obviously if, look, this is maybe assuming Kendall Morgan gets rejected and obviously we think Northern Gateway is pretty much dead in the water. Uh, how would this go about being financed uh, exactly? Would you be looking for public dollars or would you be looking for investment? Well we're going to be looking for both, but I propose that Crown Corporations, the purpose of a Crown corp Corporation is economic development and we have Crown Corporations in BC that don't achieve that, like the BC Liquor Branch and the BC Lottery Corporation. So I propose to sell those corporations, we still get the tax revenue from it, but, and that we'll have the regulatory authority over it, sell those corporations and use the money that we get from that and put it into this Crown Corporation that does actually produce economic prosperity for our province and for all of Canada, being the BC Energy and Pipeline Corporation. So that's one way in which we will help to finance this project. And as of right now, there's no set route uh, for this idea, is there? No, that's right. We don't have a set route. We're, we're going to look at what the best route is. We're going to enter consultations with First Nations, see where those mutually beneficial economic relationships are with them, where we can make this route work with First Nations. We've got a coastline that's 1,000 kilometres as a crow flies, 25,000 kilometres when you include all the, uh, the uh, inlets and such. So we've got a lot of opportunity and places with which to put a, a pipeline that we just got to figure out where it's going to go and how we're going to get to those Asian markets. You mentioned uh, in your presentation about China and its uh, growing demand for energy. Now, uh, within some circles of uh, conservative thought, there is skepticism towards China given their human rights uh, abuses and their environmental track record. There's maybe skepticism whether or not we should engage fully in uh, you know, free trade agreements or, or trade agreements with China. What are your thoughts on that, and would you maybe more focus on export deals with places like Japan, South Korea, those that are free markets uh, currently? Well, let's, let's be clear. Th those are federal issues. If the federal government wants trade agreements with China, they can come up with those. What I'm proposing here is that we need access to Asian markets. I mean, China is obviously the larger consumer over there. But in order to get access to another market besides the U.S., we need to be able to get oil to the Pacific Ocean. It's just that simple. And so we've got one customer right now, the United States. Imports there are in redu being reduced. They're going down. They're increasing their production. Barack Obama's bragging that he has basically cut oil imports by 60%. Within a few years, the U.S. could be entirely oil self-sufficient. And what are, that's going to be a crisis, an economic crisis for Canada, when they're our only customer. And if we don't address this situation, Canada is going to see some very bad economic times in the future. This is a, basically a BC solution to a Canadian economic challenge. Let's talk a little bit more about some other things that may be on your platform. I know that, uh, or let's talk about your personal history a little bit. I know you were once upon a time leader of the party. You uh, yes. stepped aside. Now you're once make, upon a time. I like uh, it. Make, <laughs> you know, not too long ago. I know it wasn't too long ago, but um, now you're making a comeback. Just maybe talk to uh, BC Conservatives about that decision uh, and uh, what went into it for you. Well, I mean, I won the leadership last time with 61 percent of the vote, and then I had a very strong mandate to to go forward. But the, the leadership of the BC Conservative Party is, is unlike the leadership of any other party, where we because we don't have a an elected representative in the legislature. So uh, the position of leader is essentially a volunteer position with little or no compensation. And after I won, I got sued by my opponent. And that lawsuit, in addition to volunteering full time for the BC Conservative Party, was a tremendous financial burden on my family. And so given the desire to essentially address my own financial situation, I decided to resign. Uh, when it became clear and evident to me, as we drew closer and closer to the leadership election here, that that no other candidates uh, of the, the stature that I offered to BC Conservatives was coming forward, that I needed to put my name back in. And so I made that choice to come back. It's not made lightly. I know exactly what I'm getting into. I've been there. I've done that. And I, I know what my mistakes were. But I also know what needs to be done differently so that we can elect Conservatives to Victoria in 2017. I think a lot of Conservatives will appreciate that honesty. Uh, one other question I, I often get asked, uh, you know, being on the Conservative side of the spectrum is, you know, why should 
conservatives in BC risk voting for the BC Conservative Party if it means another NDP government like we saw in the 1996 election, the famous election where Gordon Campbell won the popular vote but lost the election due to vote splitting with the BC Reform Party at the time. So I've asked the other candidates about this and I'm curious to see what your position is on that. Well, let's, let's be clear here. There are some ridings in this province where you add the conservative and the liberal vote together, divide it by half and we still beat the NDP in many cases by double digits. I mean, you look at North Peace and South Peace. A tremendously strong conservatives in the Chaco Lakes, where I'm from, where you know the conservative and, and liberal vote together is uh, almost 70 percent. That's and the NDP is less than 25. So vote splitting is not an issue in those ridings. Those are the ridings where we're going to focus our efforts as as BC Conservatives to win those ridings, to be competitive in those ridings where vote splitting is not an issue. And I think that's the way we need to address that issue. And so that would mean just strategically running candidates only in certain ridings. Now, does that concern you as far as being able to get, if should you become leader, to into the leadership debate against Mr. Horgan and Ms. Clark? We, we intend to run uh, candidates in as many ridings as possible across this whole province. I won't turn any candidate down. So maybe the what you said there, strategically uh, running candidates in only those ridings is not accurate. What I'm saying is, is that we will strategically apply our resources to those ones and to make sure that the people that live in those ridings know that they're not splitting the vote when they vote for a conservative. All right, Dan Brooks, thank you so much for your time today. For the Rebel.media, I'm Christopher Wilson. Thanks for watching. Click here to never miss a Rebel update. Want even more of the Rebel? Well, click here to become a premium member.